Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name's Leah Cardos and this is an analysis of the song Dollar Days by David Bowie from the album Black Star. The content of this video essay is drawn directly from my book Black Star Theory, The Last Works of David Bowie, which is available now and if you've been enjoying these analysis videos then I encourage you to buy the book because I need to sell copies, but also because there's so much more in the book uh, than just the song analyses. Anyway, that was the plug. Let's get into it. When asked by Interview Magazine in 1973, what does imprisonment mean to you? A young Bowie answered, I think I've been in prison for the last 24 years. I think coming to America has opened one door. Within a year of saying that, Bowie had left England for good. For the rest of his life, he would live abroad in Europe, the United States, even Australia, and presumably enjoyed the low tax benefits of settling for stretches of time in Luzanne, Switzerland, and the Caribbean island of Mustique, before setting up home with Iman in Manhattan. Maybe it was a lucky escape. Decades later, in 1991, on a Tin Machine tour bus en route to the Brixton Academy, Bowie asked the driver to take him through his childhood neighbourhood, with guitarist Eric Schomerhorn recalling a tearful and reflective Bowie saying, quote, It's a miracle. I probably should have been an accountant. I don't know how this all happened. Yet it seems apparent that David Jones held on to a vivid image of his English home and the idea of one day returning there. When visiting London, he made a point of visiting the landmarks of his childhood and early career. In addition to the Brixton visit to Stansfield Road in 1991, there were other occasions that we know about. Stopping by Haddon Hall in 1977 after Boland's funeral, touring around Ziggy's London haunts with journalist David Sinclair for Rolling Stone in 1993. In 2013, taking his daughter Lexi to visit Plaistow Grove, Bromley, and also Foxgrove Road in Beckenham, where he lived as a young man. There was also his involvement with the four-part BBC adaptation of Hanif Qureshi's 1990 semi-autobiographical novel, The Buddha of Suburbia. Via his wistful and reflective 1993 LP of the same name, one can sense the pulse of bittersweet nostalgia for his Brixton and Bromley roots. He spent years designing and creating his dream home in London on Gilston Road in Chelsea with interior designer and architect Jonathan Reed, which was fully appointed with Japanese-inspired minimalist detail and bespoke furnishing. In the end, he never lived in the house and it was sold in 2009. Over the years, he collected mid-century British art by the likes of David Bomberg, Leon Kossoff and Frank Arabach, Though it surprised some to learn that Bowie was interested in more than just dark and provocative pieces, as he sought out landscape paintings by the likes of Wilhelmina Barnes Graham and Brian Winter, of England's blue-grey coastlines, much of it depicting St Ives, Cornwall and evergreen countryside. When Sotheby's staged its Bowie collector sale of more than 350 artworks from David Jones's private collection in 2016, Art critic Jonathan Jones, with characteristic auteur, expressed his disappointment at the number of, quote, unglamorous artists represented, with paintings by Ivon Hitchens, Winifred Nicholson, Peter Lanyon, Graham Sutherland and their ilk. A lot of the art in Bowie's collection wallows in melancholy, nostalgic idyls of Englishness, albeit with the slightest dusting of abstraction. The last time Bowie visited Europe was when he brought his family to Venice for a working holiday. He was filming an opulent ad for Louis Vuitton, then popped over to London to see David Bowie is at the v &A in the summer of 2013. They were treated to an early morning private tour of the exhibit, which must have felt like a surreal, this is your life sort of setup. Rooms filled with the objects that prove the miraculous story of how a boy from Brixton escaped the prison of an ordinary life and his plausible destiny as an accountant to become David Bowie. That final visit also included a ride on the London Eye and a visit to St Paul's Cathedral. And he got to show Lexi some of the special places, including the houses and neighbourhoods where he grew up. 
During that visit over lunch at the Savoy with Robert Fox, Bowie tells him that he wants to begin working immediately on a new musical. According to Fox, quote, the story of a man from another planet stuck in New York, desperately trying to get home. Newton's final plan to return to the stars is impossible, as is any hope of Major Tom returning to Earth. They've travelled too far, been gone too long. Theirs is the same challenge we all face as the world continues to turn, even in the places we leave behind. A small bedroom in Brixton where a young boy dreamed of becoming a star is now a home office in someone else's house. A row of plain houses on a quiet Bromley street. A dream home standing in a neighbourhood of empty Chelsea mansions owned by rich Russians who only visit in the summer. Keep driving past, there's nothing to see. The sad truth that all prodigal children know. You can never go home again. The song Dollar Days is track six on the album of Black Star. The tempo is 60 beats per minute, quickening to 120 beats per minute in the verses. The tonalities are G minor in the verses and B minor in the choruses, and the song form is a standard verse chorus form with an intro, verse, chorus, verse, middle eight, chorus, and outro. In this reading of Dollar Days, the chord progressions and shifting tonalities tell a story. The music hovers around, moves towards, and suggests the idea of home, but it never finds its way there. To gain a better understanding of how music can suggest such things, we look to music theory and to the idea of cadence. Cadence is the configuration of harmonies or chords in a sequence that suggests movement towards a resolution. Cadence points are a characteristic embedded within the Western tonal tradition, and they function as indicators of tonality and key, setting up a listener's expectation of where home might be, where phrases might expect to find their final resolution, interruption, or surprise. The quality and movement between chords and pitches within a tonal system are understood in relation to the tonic the root or the home chord and its established key tonality, whether that be major, minor, or some other mode. A movement that resolves to the tonic or establishes a new one has a stabilizing finality. These are the full stops of Western musical grammar that most ears have become attuned to. You can probably hear some of these readily in your head. Some common examples are the plagal cadence, which I've already talked about, four to one which is the amen at the end of a hymn and there's the perfect cadence five one which is the finality you can sense in the last two chords of the happy birthday song but movement in a different direction can create other effects energies that lean pull and push towards or away from what we expect to hear motions that can be ambiguous become trapped and frustrated, resolutions denied and left as unfinished business. Dollar Days starts with the sound of pages turning, or paper money being handled and counted out. The music begins with a gentle stirring piano and bass hovering between E flat major 7 and F6. It's a similar movement to Fleetwood Mac's Dreams from 1977. The presence of D across both of those chords adds colour in addition to setting up the expectation that the tonality is going to be B flat major. This is a kind of Lydian effect, but my interpretation is that this passage is actually not Lydian. The first chord we hear is not the root chord, but chord 4 major 7 moving to 5, 6. Since the modal effect of the raised fourth is not present and the resolution towards B flat major is subtly suggested in the keyboards, um, I'm not going to say it's Lydian, but it flirts with it, which makes it interesting. Incidentally, that D note, which is present throughout this intro, will also serve as a connecting thread throughout the entire piece. The point from which the song hinges between the two tonal territories, the pragmatism of the verses in G minor and the emotions of the chorus in B minor. During the dreamy opening, the musical pulse suggests a tempo of 60 beats per minute, the relaxed patience of a ticking clock. 
Monda's guitar adorns the changes with atmospheric picking. McCaslin's saxophone wakes, yawns and stretches. A blink from the drums and the band snaps out of the daydream and into G minor. Drums and acoustic guitar quickening the pulse to 120 beats per minute. In the absence of a demo, the instrumental arrangement for Dollar Days was developed on the spot in the studio. The basis of the groove in the verses was crafted by Juliana with assistance on the day from James Murphy. The tom and strom patterns kind of remind me of Days from Reality, the delayed backbeat that kicks on the fourth beat of the bar. From a precarious D on top of G minor, Bowie's vocal is cradled aloft as the music steps carefully downwards through pastel chord changes. The lyrics of the first verse set out at first an image of mundane but pleasant existence, followed by a suggestion of longing. Both punctuated by the repetition, it's nothing to me, it's nothing to see. These faux dismissive words betrayed by upper vocal harmonies that hit a tone of vulnerability at the top of his vocal register. The chorus pivots swiftly to an entirely new tonal area, strongly suggesting B minor, and returns again to the more dreamlike 60 BPM pulse of the intro. The busyness of the verses, toms and acoustic guitars collapsing into heavier, widescreen drama and expressive piano, lush strings, bass and cymbals crashing upon the beat in stubborn waves. The chord changes throughout the chorus remained pinned down by an E in the bass that never lets go, an anchoring tether that prevents all movement and resolution. The harmony starts on the dark but hopeful E minor 7 and attempts to move to F sharp 7 over E, a dominant seventh energy that wants to rise but is thwarted by its stubborn bass note. A on top of E is more stable, but it's another dead end. It can't provide a way to B minor, the resolution that the music is pulling towards. Bowie's melody stays in place for the most part, fidgeting against adjacent notes. The music in the chorus supports the lyrical images of frustration and striving. Snapping back to the carefully treading realities of G minor, verse 2 builds on the structure established in the first. Mundane, elusive imagery, made more troubling this time around with alliterative dollar days and survival sex, the replacement of walking down with falling down, echoing an image from Newton's crisis point in Lazarus. I'm falling back. After a second mention and dismissal of the English Evergreens, McCaslin's solo in the middle eight section takes the song to its home in B minor for the first time, releasing all of the pent up tension accumulated so far from the carefully tethered harmonies and tight melodic range up to this point. Comparable to the solo break in Lazarus that seemed to dramatize the struggle to fly, this solo revels in its temporary freedom, expressive and nimble, pulling contours that dance up the walls, weightless yet sure-footed. It's a short-lived reprieve as the chorus returns, again to pin the rest of the song down as firmly as before, now with ominous vocal textures lurching in the shadows. Reminiscent of the joining segue between sections A and B of Blackstar. Across the outro, Bowie repeats the words, I'm trying to, I'm dying to. While the music struggles between two stubborn major chords, a minor third apart, F sharp and A, both held over an E in the bass. It's a similar chord relationship to the one that supports the climactic 
You Are Not Alone moment of rock and roll suicide. That was similarly teased in You Feel So Lonely You Could Die and The Informer from the Next Day Project. Here, the E in the bass prevents the build-up of any momentum. It's all striving and heavy effort. Locked in this futile tug of war, pushing from F sharp over E and pulling from A over E, there is simply no way home from here. The song never resolves, it slowly drowns. A new shape emerges from the tension between these two oppositional harmonic forces. Climbing up from Monda's lead guitar, a line that feels very Ronson-esque in shape, with similar angles and tone to the segue and closing theme of 1970's Width of a Circle. Coincidentally, the same moment in the song on stage when Ziggy would perform The Flying Eagle. The line is traced by the strings with increasing width, height and scope. As Bowie's voice and the thrashing drums are lost to the waves, this monolithic theme rises tall and triumphant out of the ocean. Like Newton trapped and dreaming himself away out of his limbo, Dolladay's dreams up its own ending and finds a different way home. It's not the resolution you thought you were running to. Instead, you find a way to transcend. 